Thank you. Um, and um, thank you for uh, inviting us today. Um, so you're asking how I came to write the book. Uh, before I say a bit about that, I should probably tell you a bit about the book if you don't know already. It's called Jeannie and Paul, and it's set in uh, London and Mauritius, where my family are originally from. Um, and it's based on an 18th century French pastoral romance called Paul et Virginie. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that later. But... Um, I, can, I, I think I've, I've, um, my uh, desire to write this book is very interlinked with my desire to, my ambition to want to be a writer in the first place. It's my first novel. Um, when I was growing up, it was before the days of internet, and I was a very keen reader and keen to know about Mauritius, the island where my parents had come from. But I had no real access to any kind of Mauritian literature. And um, apart from this one novel, Paul et Virginie, but it was in French. Um, and when I, as a teenager, I got enough French to be able to read it, it was very, um, it was both an exciting moment and also a very disappointing one because obviously being set in the 18th century and being written by um, a Frenchman um, at a time when Mauritius was a, still a French colonial possession, there was no real connection for me there with, with that book. It seemed very much a kind of um, historical romance. And so I think I felt something then about, the, um, about fiction and invisibility, what it's like to sort of be, not, not really be bit visible in fiction. And uh, that instilled in me a desire to want to write. And that's how I came to write this book, which is in effect a response to that, uh, to Paul et Virginie. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can I ask before I start, has anyone actually heard of the word Lascar? My book is called Lascar. I ask this wherever I go, um, because this word isn't actually used anymore. So can we have a show of hands, perhaps? Well, that, that's pretty interesting. Um, the meaning of the word Lascar is sailor from East India. Now, my novel is set in the early... Uh, in the late 19th century, um, and it tells the story of an East Indian seaman. Uh, e East India is um, present-day Bangladesh, and these men actually worked on British steamships, uh, ferrying back cargoes such as tea, coffee, sugar, porcelain, uh, and other items uh, to England. And they were hired by the East India Company. And what inspired me to write the novel um, was uh, we actually have family history of someone on my father's side who was Alaska. And that gave me the idea of actually writing it as a novel. I think with history books today, a lot of people don't pick up history books to read them. They would use them, you know, if they needed it for some reference. And I decided to write it as a fictional novel because it's the best way to get the story out. And it's a subject that's not really talked about today. Um, and that's why I thought, you know, you can do anything with fiction. You can take a bit of history, make it very interesting. You can take it any way that you really want. And, uh, you know, that's how I came about that. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about myself. I was born in Cambridge. Uh, my father arrived in England in... 1957, and he was the, one of the very early East Pakistani settlers. You have to remember, East Pakistan, uh, it was East Pakistan at the time, and then it became Bangladesh in 1971. That was the year that I was born. Um, so he set up one of the first Indian restaurants in Cambridge, um, and that's where my siblings and I, we all grew up. And uh, we heard stories through generations that we had someone who actually worked on a steamship. But we don't actually have any record of it or any sort of information about that. So I thought, uh, I did a lot of research and I looked into that. And, uh, and I realized that there were thousands and thousands of Laskers actually who worked on uh, steamships. Uh, but their story has been untold. And most of them actually settled in East London. So that's where the connection is here, even though I don't live in London. Um, and I thought, you know, particularly Whitechapel is where most of these... 
men actually settled. They settled with no, um, they didn't actually plan to settle here. Um, they had no choice because they were abandoned here and um, that's where they set up their lives and uh, that's how the Asian community gradually started to grow. So, you know, that's a little bit about my novel and uh, shall I pass it do, to you? Could you yeah. just tell me, oh sorry, uh, where did you do the research? How did you get this information? Is there anything handed down by your family, by, you know, kind no, of verbal it, it stuff? No, it wasn't or? actually, uh, not, not at all. I think I found a lot of the information online, particularly East London as well. You know, as I said, um, Whitechapel, Shadwell, Wapping, that's where most of these men settled. Um, but it actually dates back to over 400 years ago when they first started to come here. Um, and, you know, it's just sad that I think that these men are, have been forgotten. And I'm just hoping to educate more people through my novel. And it, I call it faction rather than fiction. It's based on facts, but I wrote it as a fictional novel just to make it more interesting. Um, so, you know, I, I get a lot of questions asking, you know, is it a true story? But in fact, it could have happened to any Alaska. It's a typical sort of um, story of how my character, called Ayan, how he came uh, to work on a ship in Calcutta and then he travelled to England, but he decided to abandon ship with his friends and settle in East London. And that happened to many, many Alaskas. So, for both of you, is there a, I mean, both of you have chosen to write about somebody who's got conflicts about, I mean, in your story, in the end, it's Arthur who, who is torn about which way he's going to go in, in his yes. future, and goes back. Um, is, is it for both of you who've had parents from somewhere else, and um, do you, in yourselves, experience some kind of... Um, issue as to where home is or or anything like that Natasha because you did did you go back to Mauritius to research the book or had you been anyway I, d I did spend some time there um, I went there for six weeks to do some general research um, but um, I didn't actually go to Mauritius until I was in my late 20s so I had never been so it was quite an imaginary place for me that's partly where that connection with Paul et Virginie comes from. It's a way of trying to sort of help, help myself imagine a place that was, while it was part of my personal story, in the sense it's where my family came from, um, I had no real experience of it. Um, in terms of uh, displacement, and that is a big theme in, in yeah. both our books, yeah. um, it was quite strange because I think had I... I was born in East London, but my dad joined the RAF, so we moved around every two or three years. And um, I think London might have provided a sort of default identity for me had we stayed there. But we didn't, we kept moving about. And um, I think that sense of not really being rooted in a place and um, having my parents come from a place that I was never able to visit really did... Um, I think, kind of uh, instill that sense of slight uh, outsiderness in me, but which is very useful for a writer, I think. Okay. And what about you, Shahida? Did, when did you first go to Bangladesh? Um, well, I was born in Cambridge, so I, th I think I visited about four times. I got married there as well. Um, but every time you visit your home country, it changes. It's never the same as when you first visit it. You know, things change, people change. Um, but I think with my novel itself, it, it, it's set in Silet, uh, which is present-day Bangladesh. So I wanted to set it there. Um, it's quite difficult to find a lot of information about how lives were actually lived there. But most of the men, they travelled to India, uh, Calcutta, and they boarded uh, ships. Uh, they were employed. So I get a lot of questions asking, were they actually slaves? Uh, they weren't, they, they wanted to find work, they were paid, although many were underpaid. Um, and, and then uh, he, uh, the main character, he travels to England, Victorian England, and I think I, I particularly set it at that time because I think that's when the majority of them actually came here. Um, but it, it was really trying to get my mind in, inside uh, a, a typical Alaska. Um, 
my story has everything sort of in it, a, 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 an epic adventure, you know, and you have to have a love story as well, you know, to make it more interesting. It's but, a very interesting yeah. love story, though, with <laughs> an upper-class girl. But, but it actually did have, you know, it, th these men married an uh, English woman and they settled here because of the lack of Asian women at the time in England. And, um, you know, it, it's not a uh, made-up story. Many did settle like that, so... Um, but I, I, I thought it would make it more interesting. You know, these women were actually made outcasts in their society. Um, were actually marrying into, uh, you know, marrying Asian men. So, um, but the family history aspect of it, I don't have a lot of information about that. Uh, but I can sort of imagine after doing the research what he might have gone through, whether he did even go back home as well. But this was generations ago, I have to say. Well, it's interesting you say about it changing as well, because that's mm. clear in your novel as well, um, Natasha, that when, he, when, he, when Paul goes back and when, uh, when Jeannie goes back to Mauritius, it's very, very different from... And, and going over to Rodriguez is what makes reminds her of how Mauritius would have been... So how did you sort of get... Because both of them have a very strong sense of place that comes through in, in um, not just in sort of descriptions of the, the landscape and, and, and the, the atmosphere, but also the way people behave. Um, in your book, the, the woman who he consults, the description of Lady... I can't remember what a her charming. name is. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, which gives a, a tremendous flavour of how it would have been back then. And in, the, in, the, in your book as well, so how did you, each of you, respectively, know how to get that atmosphere if you hadn't been? Well, you couldn't have been because it was years ago. And how did, that, how did you do that? Well, um, I, I had, I'd, um, I've been to Mauritius twice. And um, for each time, it was just basically an extended holiday. But I think um, the experience I uh, referred to earlier of having been brought up as a child of uh, someone in the RAF and this constant having to um, move home does help hone your skills of um, sort of observation, I think. Or if, if you grow up in one place for all your life, perhaps you don't have such a sense of... Um, uh, noticing the differences between places, wh whereas if you're yeah. constantly having yeah. to move, it's almost a survival mechanism, I think, because you're having to kind of suss out what the people are like and, you know, what the, what the kind of uh, different cultural aspects are. So I, I think that helped a, a lot. And what mm. about you, um, Shahida? Because is there much resort, uh, you know, material that you can go to to have a look at what it was like in Select back then? I think um, that I found it through some records, really, you know, what life would have been like over there. So it's just a typical life where um, they would have, uh, you know, sell rice and beetle nuts and, you know, that sort of thing. They, they would go into farming. Um, but I think, you know, even today that, that's still present. You know, there's a lot of people still living their lives as they did over 100 years ago, particularly the poor people. But it's gradually changing. But I think it's um, when you do visit your homeland, I think you appreciate more the fact that, you know, what you have here, you know, your, your own life here, how better off you are than these other people. But I think, um, you know, I sort of portrayed everything, you know, in my novel where the fact that Ayan and his brother Kazi, and they, and they grew up as orphans, and uh, they lived a, a hard life. Um, and they didn't have anyone to look after them. And then uh, his brother develops cancer and he decides to take to the sea, you know, to work as Alaska to help his brother. Um, and I think um, I, th I can sort of relate that to, you know, my father who had uh, his brother. And, and they used to look out for each other all the time. And they were orphan, made orphans quite young. So I think I had that in my mindset when I actually wrote the novel. So I, I can sort of compare. Um, but I think it's when you do write a novel, I think you sort of, um, you've got something to sort of compare to, you know, I, I don't know if uh, Nat Natasha, you'd agree with the same thing, you know, on your background experiences, um, your, when you wrote your novel, is it based on experiences that you actually had 
uh, when you were younger, in your childhood? Yes, I did um, draw on a lot of personal experience and then graft it onto the, the story that I'd devised. So there is some... While, while the whole story isn't autobiographical, I don't have a brother, a, a brother who's gone missing. I haven't spent six weeks trying to search for him. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of uh, my own personal um, experience there. Yes, I would agree with that. Yes. On a slightly, slightly different note, um, faith is a big, plays a big role in um, Ion's, is it Ian? Ion. Ion's, Ion, yeah. Ion's uh, life. Yeah. He has a terrible time and at various pivotal points mm. when he feels he can't go on and actually some nice things like when he, he has that funny, sorry about this ringing, I don't know what, it's really horrible. I think it's because the speakers are... I'm in front of the speakers. Um, he... The, the nice kind of exchange with the cat. And he, ha, he has... So he... And he often arrives at decisions, as it were, via uh, a, a kind of exchange with Allah. Or a kind yes, of... I think um, my main character, he's a Muslim, uh, but back in the late 19th century, the uh, Muslim men actually found it very hard to follow their religion because it was a Christian country um, and these men were looked at as aliens, you know, that they were foreign people that arrived in England with a, a religion that was seen wicked, you know, and they, they were seen as wicked people. And I think um, a lot of uh, these men, they did convert to Christianity because they found it very hard to follow their lives according to their faith. But I sort of bring that into my book as well, where he has doubts about his religion. You know, how can he carry on like this, uh, you know, in a difficult, uh, in, in a country like that? But I think it's, it helped him, you know, towards the end to examine his own faith, you know, what was really true to him. Uh, but I, I felt that I had to put that in the novel because it wasn't all plain sailing in those days. You know, it was uh, a very difficult time. But even though there were English men that actually converted uh, to Islam at the time, but they were also seen as outcasts in society. Uh, but I, you know, I, I thought that that would, you know, I needed to sort of bring that in. You know, faith is very important to anyone, you know, at that time. And uh, it, it was just a very important, you know, I think it was a main part of the, of the book, I have to say. It's just interesting because um, Shahida made a contribution to a, a book called Behind the Hijab, and it, there was an interesting uh, statement you make at the beginning, and I wondered if that was something that was borne out by the research that you did, because you said... Um, uh, the tension between the extremists within the contemporary religious community is more intense today than it has been in roughly seven centuries, which I think yes. was a very mm. interesting statement. I'm sure we would all, living in the East End, we would understand that. But I wondered if in your research it had... And because, the, because in the book it's interesting that the, the most sympathetic response Ian and Phoebe get when they're going to try to get married is from the Muslim community, actually. Yes, so. yes. I think, you know, obviously in those days they didn't approve of men marrying uh, English women, so it was difficult uh, for them too, but it was the only way of surviving uh, in the country. And, you know, gradually these men were slowly um, accepted into society, but these women are also made outcasts. Uh, but the article that Barbara's talking about is um, I wrote about the the integration of the hijab into police uniforms, uh, particularly Cambridgeshire, where they designed um, a hijab especially for a female police officer who was a Muslim. Um, so I, I wrote about that. That's the article that Barbara's talking about. Uh, but yes, I, and I think it's you know, I have to say it is hard as well, even today. I, th I think things have changed, you know, so much, but, yeah. Natasha, I, I think it's interesting because in your book, I'm not sure whether I thought faith or a particular um, um, religion or anything was played a particular part. And the, the funny thing is that the thing that comes into my head instead of that is the, is the drug culture that you describe in, in London, which I thought was fantastically well observed and the dragon bar for example i 
I know the Dragon Bar. My eldest son used to hang out in a Dragon Bar as well. <laughs> but uh, do you think that? Do you feel that there was a, as a, you know, how do you feel about that? Um, that's interesting because um, when uh, Shahida was talking, I was thinking, yeah, faith is clearly central to Lascar. Um, but um, I think there's a certain faithlessness that's at the centre of this book. Um, the, um, the character, one of the main characters, Paul, is um, very lost. And um, that sense of him, him being lost is um, quite linked, I think, to the fact that he doesn't really have faith in anything, um, apart perhaps from um, an ideal of uh, Mauritius that he still clings to, having left the country as a child and uh, wanting to go back, but um, once I think, he does... I think, can I just say, it's more of the cultural identity, would you say, rather than the faith itself. I think with cultural identity, a lot of people don't want to lose that, um, but then faith sort of gets entwined at the same time, so... Would yeah, you agree I, with that, uh, Natasha? I, th I think I mean faith in the broadest sense of the word, yeah. in terms of belief. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, if you're a writer, you can have faith in literature, for example. That can yes. be something that's, um, as, uh, that, that defines the way you, you uh, live, perhaps. Um, but yes, with, with Paul, he's, it, there's no religious faith yes. there, but neither is there any particular belief in anything else, really, as opposed to his sister Jeannie, who um, has a strong sense of um, faith in family. And that's something that guides her. Um. Yes, yeah. Um, I read um, the article, I think, it, was it in The Independent? You wrote a very funny article about um, going to a retreat <laughs> somewhere to, to, to get over the writer's block with, was it with Luke that Luke you went? Williams, Luke Williams, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how you nearly threw a kind of, or somebody. Yes, somebody you're not, threw you don't make, <laughs> make clear who it is. Nearly lobbed baked beans at the other one, <laughs> and that you don't get over writer's block by repairing to somewhere else. You take it with you. But it's interesting because you are writing your next book. Is you've written two chapters? Is that right? In the echo chamber, which sadly we do not have in the consortium. So I downloaded it onto my Kindle, but then I realised it's very difficult to scroll through. So I wasn't able to. I don't know if they're identified, the chapters that you write, or is it...? Um, they're not ident they're, um, identified in an acknowledgement at the back. Okay, um, right. And um, the idea behind that was we didn't want... Um, well, Luke, Luke suggested that, um, that he put an acknowledgement in the front that I had uh, contributed these two chapters, and I asked him not to do that because oh. I thought it might be a bit too... Um, uh, unbalanced, unnerving for a reader who's opening up a book by Luke Williams and then is suddenly told that two of the chapters they're about to read will be written by someone else. I didn't want the reader to be distracted in that way, so it's acknowledged at the back. Right. But then a lot of the reviews picked it up anyway. Really? So yes, really? Okay. Could you say something about that process? It's quite interesting to do, have a collaborative writing process, and the next uh, book that you're doing is with Luke, isn't it? It is, yes. How does yes. that work? Um, well, Luke and I met when we were uh, studying for an MA in creative writing together, and we quickly became one another's first readers. So um, whenever I had something, you know, when I was working on this, I would show Luke parts of the book in progress, and he would do the same with his. And um, being someone's first reader, if you're a writer yourself, can sometimes... Um, uh, it can be a form of collaboration in the way that a partnership with a, an editor who gets creatively involved can be a sort of collaboration. And Luke had got to a certain point in his novel where um, his character, Evie, um, was um, fed up of telling her own story, so she turned to transcription, the transcription of her personal papers in order to continue telling her story. And um, Luke thought he might enact that process of transcription by asking someone else to write these, uh, these diary chapters, which he asked me to, to oh, write. Oh, very clever, yes. 
Well, it's mainly because he had writer's block and didn't know <laughs> how to get out of it. So is the new one, is that, that's the, the, that's the, the echo, echo chamber. chamber. So how's the new one going to be? Um, so with the new book, we've conceived it together and um, there are certain parts of it which I will take responsibility for and certain parts which he, he's managing, but we will be swapping over. So um, if, if it does get published... Uh, Neither of us will lay particular claim to parts of the book. It will just be a, a, a dual authorship. But it's about the island of Diego Garcia in the Chagos Archipelago, which is, is owned by the uh, British, but it's been leased to the US as a military base. It's, it's quite... Um, uh, and in order to facilitate that leasing, um, all the Chagos Islanders were um, uh, forced off the islands. So. Can I just be clear? That's the part. That's those are the islands that Mauritius is part of, and is it's, it? they because no, I, do, <laughs> I got an a, I got an A in geography A level, believe it or not. Um, it's not actually. They're in the Indian Ocean, but um, interestingly, there is a dispute over uh, Mauritius is laying claim to them, um, but um, I'm not quite sure where we're at with the the uh, negotiations now but I think that um, well I, I know that uh, Chagossian, some of the Chagossian islanders when they were forced off their islands ended up being sent to Mauritius um, so there is a connection there yes